Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture. The year 2017 will mark the 500th anniversary of the beginning of the Protestant Revolution. In the year 1517, a young Augustinian monk by the name of Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the door of the Castle Church at Wittenberg, protesting certain teachings and practices of the Catholic Church and sparking a revolution within the heart of Christendom. Today, nearly 500 years later, there are over 30,000 Protestant denominations. Yet, there remains but one holy Catholic Church. Join Dr. William Marshner, a Protestant convert to Catholicism and professor of theology at Christendom College, as we consider the roles which Luther, Calvin, and Zwingli played in one of the saddest moments in the history of the Church. Please enjoy this presentation of the Protestant Revolution. St. John the Evangelist, pray for us. Good to have Dr. Marshner back again, 45 minutes and then a seven-minute break. Yeah, okay. needs and wishes. There is no need to choose between the Pope who excommunicated and the Pope who lifted because the conduct of the persons involved changed in the meantime. Okay. All right, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Grace, Lord, is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Seat of wisdom. Pray for us. Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right. I am going to spend our first segment today mainly talking about the facts of Zwingli's life, the formation of his mind, and then after the break I will get into his ever interesting points of doctrine. Zwingli was seven months younger than Luther. He was born in uh, 1484 promising lad at the academics. When he was 10 years old, he was sent to St. Theodore's Latin School in the Swiss city of Basel. Uh, you don't spell it like the spice. It's B-A-S-L-E, Basel. He was 10 years old at the time. Four years later, 1498, he became a pupil of Switzerland's foremost humanist, a man named Henry Wölflin, which, because it's a German name he didn't like, translated into Latin. Now, Wölflin is the wolf. So he became known under the name of Lupulus. Lupulus, the little wolf. Now, what does it mean to say that somebody was a humanist in those days? <laughs> certainly did not mean then what it means today. Today, humanism is the name of an anti or, or atheistic religion that celebrates uh, human beings, their works, their arts, their history, and so on as the foremost thing of value in the universe. That was not what humanism meant in the uh, 15th and 16th centuries. Then, you called yourself a humanist if you were a fan of classical literature, if you admired Latin, if you were interested in the ancient languages, the biblical languages, if you sought to model your writing and your thinking on classical authors, if you wrote history uh, the way Livy did, if you wrote poems the way Virgil did, if you were into the classical authors, you were allowed to call yourself a humanist. And that was indeed uh, Zwingli's first love. By the way, Zwingli's first name is Ulrich. U-L-R-I-C-H. Ulrich. Zwingli. Now, depending on which biographies you pick up, you'll often see him uh, abbreviated as H. Zwingli. 
That's because the Germans at that time couldn't make up their mind whether the word Ulrich had an H on the front or not. Many people called him Hulrich. So never mind that um, little ambiguity. In 1500, at the age of 16, young Ulrich's uncle sent him to study at the university in Vienna mainly to get him out of the way in Basel because of political turmoil. One of the young Zwingli's characteristics was political passion, as we shall see in a moment. In 1502, he came back to Switzerland and started his career as a school teacher in the parish school of St. Martin in Basel. And then, two years later, he uh, got his uh, baccalaureate degree. So in other words, he started teaching in the Paris school before he was finished his education. And it was a seminary education. So in 1504, at the age of 20, he gets his baccalaureate, he becomes a seminary grad, but he does not take holy orders yet. That wouldn't be for another two years. And in the meantime, in 1505, another famous humanist came to Basel, and Zwingli got to know him. This fellow was named Thomas Wittenbach. Thomas Wittenbach, W-Y-T-T-E-N-B-A-C-H. I'm sorry about all these Wittens that get into Reformation history, Wittenberg. This is Wittenbach. It's a man's name. He was, again, a humanist and someone who was absorbing his inspiration from the great uh, headmaster of the humanists of Europe in those days. That headmaster was Erasmus of Rotterdam, about whom I'll have more to say later. Wittenbach got from Erasmus the idea now, what we need to do these days is go back to the scriptures and the fathers. The main thing that inspired Erasmus' idea of church reform was that scholastic theology was junk. It was awful. It was in bad Latin. It was constantly... Uh, disputing about questions that no one with any sense could possibly care about. It was nitpicking. It was um, basically uh, a waste of one's mind. <coughs> one should go back to the classical authors. That means that you should leave aside philosophical difficulties and preach, teach, think, in the way that ancient rhetoricians thought. The fathers of the church were, one and all, uh, well-educated in classical rhetoric. Uh, nobody more so, of course, um, than St. Augustine, whose Latin is just full of word plays. Um, it gets so I can't read him. It's, it's lump the dump the clink, the lump the lump the clunk. It's just very musical and uh, periodic writing. But St. Augustine was certainly not alone in that respect. All of the followers of the church were uh, expert rhetoricians, rhetoricians in the ancient art of speech making. St. John Chrysostom wasn't called golden mouth for nothing. It's because he could give these beautiful speeches. Uh, likewise, the, um, the Cappadocian fathers in Basel, St. Gregory of Nyssa, St. Gregory Nazianzen, had thoroughgoing educations in the humanities of their time, the classics. And Wittenbach told the young Zwingli, this is the way to go. Go back to them. Get rid of this scholastic stuff and limit your attention to what we nowadays call positive theology. The distinction we make nowadays is between speculative theology and positive theology. Positive theology is the study of the word of God. It's the attempt to use scholarship to hear more exactly what God is saying. Okay? In the scriptures, 
in the apostolic traditions, in the monuments of antiquity, study to learn exactly what God is telling us in those sacred texts and monuments. This is the work of positive theology. Now, once you have heard and you have the revealed datum fairly clear, then you can ask philosophical questions. You can see if you get any help in understanding the mystery from points that Plato made, or points that Aristotle made, or points that the Stoics made, or points that the logicians can make. And of course, there are plenty of points in the revealed message which gain light from the application of those disciplines. Well, putting those disciplines together with theology so as to draw more conclusions from the revealed word, that's the work of speculative theology. All the fathers did some. Okay. You can't find this distinction between the positive and the speculative in somebody like St. Basil. It's not there. You can't find it in somebody like St. Athanasius, because he's both. He's an expositor of the scriptures and a darn good philosopher in his own right. Okay. So, but, but in later times, this um, division of labor, so to speak, comes to the fore. And the scholastic theologians are the ones we think of mainly as the speculative theologians, uh, St. Bonaventure, uh, St. Thomas, um, Don Scotus, etc. By the way, in his earlier years, uh, we're now at uh, 1505, so he's 21 years old, in his earlier years, um, Zwingli had absorbed the philosophical lessons from scholasticism as they were taught in his day. And, alas, what he ran into was Scotus. He never read Aquinas to know anything about it. His exposure to scholasticism was in the form of warmed over Scotus. Now, um, I can't take time now to explain what difference that makes in uh, theoretical terms. But one thing it did for Zwingli, I can mention now because it became very, very clear in his later life. Scotus emphasized the will of God above everything else. Scotus is what we call a voluntarist in theology. What? Nobody ever denied, of course, that God wills things, has a will, and so on. But for Scotus, God's will determines good and evil. <clears throat> not God's mind, not God's judgment, not God's wisdom, but God's will determines the good and the bad. If God had willed to command opposite things from what he has in fact commanded, then those opposite things would be good and would be obligatory. Scotus himself never went so far to say what William of Ockham said, but he came close. William of Ockham said, look, if God had commanded us to hate him, that would have been our duty, that would have been good. That's an outrageous expression of the voluntarist position, but very much within the logic of that position. Zwingli will learn from this that the Ten Commandments are obligatory for us as a matter of arbitrary divine preference. In other words, the commandments have only a conventional basis, if you will. God established the convention. I think I'll command these things. So the convention gets set up. Thereafter, they're obligatory. But there's nothing in human nature 
that calls out for those very commandments as the way of life. If you are uh, infused with the voluntarism of SCOTUS, you cannot get deeply into the spirit of the church fathers. And that will turn out to be Zwingli's problem. Much as he wanted to be a patristic scholar and use the fathers to interpret the Bible, sounds like the right thing to do, still he was not able to enter deeply into the mind of the fathers, as we will see in due time. At the age of 22, in 1506, Zwingli got his licentiate in theology, what we call today an MA in theology, and accepted ordination at Constance. He was assigned to the parish church in the little town of Glaris, G-L-A-R-I-S, if it matters to you. And there he stayed for 10 years. So from 1506 to 1516, he's a parish priest in Glaris and is in perfectly good standing as a priest of the Catholic Church. In 1510, he became a disciple of that headmaster I mentioned before, uh, Erasmus of Rotterdam. And I can't resist reading to you a bit of a letter that Zwingli wrote to Erasmus in <coughs> that year. It's a sorry example of groveling. <laughs> Listen to this. At the moment I am writing to you, O oh best of men, Dr. Erasmus, I feel myself terrified by the splendor of your erudition. Uh, which would take a far vaster world to exhaust than the one we live in. You are, in effect, for us, the lover who ravishes us, wakes us up from the dream so that we can speak. Through your universal well-doing, I have become, too late, no doubt, devoted to you. <laughs> devoted to you as Aeschines was devoted to Socrates. It's a classical allusion in there. He's a humanist. Uh, if you do not accept this gift, my loyalty, unworthy of you, I will think of myself like the Corinthians who were disdained by Alexander. I will feel that I have been given by you more than by any other. But if you accept, if you decide even to repulse me, that will be okay. Because nothing would better correct my life than to have displeased a man such as you. <laughs> So, whether you want to or not, you are going to be doing me good. Use me henceforth as you will, as your slave. Right. Well, let's put it this way. He was uh, very good at turning on the rhetoric of humble abasement, and certainly had the intention of being an all-flags-flying disciple of Erasmus. Now, the crucial year before his wing, just as the year when he nailed up the 95 Theses was the crucial year for Luther, the crucial year for Zwingli was 1516, because of three things that happened in that year. First of all, Erasmus published the New Testament in Greek. It was the first printed edition. Okay. 
you know, the, the printing press was a little more than 50 years old at this point. And lots of Latin material had been printed in some other Western languages, but not Greek. So getting the fonts for Greek and getting uh, a, a critically uh, suitable Greek text to publish in, in printed form was a great achievement. Erasmus did it in 1516. And immediately, Zwingli went head over heels into Greek. He wouldn't read the Bible in any other language anymore. Well, of course, he learned Greek pretty fast, uh, steeped himself in it, wouldn't touch the Vulgate, which was the Latin Bible, anymore, and was uh, completely enamored of everything Greek. As a matter of fact, Luther complained bitterly about it. Years later, Luther and Zwingli had a famous argument at the University of Marburg. It was an argument mainly about the Eucharist. And Luther said, will that fellow please shut up speaking Greek? Doesn't he think the rest of us know any? What is this parade? <laughs> And by the way, this is a whole year before he had heard anything of Luther. 1516 saw another important event in Zwingli's life. That was the year that the Pope, at that time Leo X, signed a concordat with King Francis I of France. Wow, popes are signing concordats with kings and potentates all the time. What's the big deal? Zwingli hated the French. <laughs> the Swiss cantons were jealous of their independence. They saw French aggression as their principal enemy. Zwingli had always hoped that their Catholic connection with the Holy See would help preserve them from the French. But now the Pope had gotten himself in league with the French. Well, it was recorded anyway. Oh, that was awful. And so he turns against the papacy. Not yet completely in its capacity as a religious authority, but as a player in the affairs of Europe. In other words, he becomes anti-papal in matters of politics and diplomacy. He'll go on from there, I'm sorry to say. 1516 is also the year when Zwingli tried to give up the girls. Uh -huh. Now, uh, he's been a parish priest for about 10 years. Nevertheless, he could not keep his hands off the ladies. He um, confessed this uh, a year later because he was nominated to a parish in Zurich. He's been at Glarus for 10 years. Now, thanks to the influence of <coughs> people who know him as uncle principally, he is suggested to be called to Zurich to take over the, the big, the Grossminster there, the big church in Zurich. And questions are raised about his morals. So, in 1517, he wrote a letter and... Um, <coughs> admits his faults and tries to defend himself. Let me read you a bit from that letter. He wrote a long letter to one of the canons of the church. He says, about three years ago, I took the resolve to have no more relation with women because St. Paul says it's good for a man not to have contact with them. I held on to my resolution at Glarus for six months. <laughs> and then um, at Einziel for, uh, for a year. But alas, then I fell back and became the dog who returns to his own vomit, as the Apostle Peter says. That's... Uh, 2 Peter chapter 2, the passage. 
So he admits he tried to maintain chaste, chastity, he failed, but he doesn't say, on account of this generous canon and noble patron of Zurich, I feel I have to have my name withdrawn <coughs> from consideration. No, no, no. He says, the person I was having my affair with was only the daughter of a barber. <laughs> she had other lovers, and everybody knew it. The baby she's carrying, she doesn't know if it's mine. <laughs> she may well believe it, but can she know it with certitude? Question mark. And three things, he says, I have always promised. That I would never corrupt a virgin. I would never take a wife from somebody else. And I would never turn aside a woman in religious life. Now, these three rules I have kept. <laughs> he also recommended himself in this letter for his discretion. I've been 10 years at Glarus, and even my closest friends hardly suspect. <laughs> All right. Now, that gives you, I'm afraid, quite an insight into Zwingli's character. With Zwingli, as with so many other people, however, don't confuse unchastity with coldness towards the things of God. He is a hot gospeler. Well, you might think of Elmer Gantry, if you remember that awful movie. But hey, he's, a, he, he's a hot preacher and a very zealous student of the Bible and a very zealous admirer of Erasmian virtue, even though he finds that in this crucial area, he's too weak to practice it to his satisfaction. Now, he got the parish assignment in Zurich, and his crucial year is in 1519. He's in Zurich for a year. He's still accepted as perfectly Catholic in his belief, but in 1519, he begins to start learning about Luther. And already in that year, he had the following to say about the Holy See. He's not gonna bend his knees towards Rome, he says, I desire to strip away the turpitude of the prostituted bepurpled one so that Israel may see finally that the light that has come into the world through Christ has been made vile by her. Now, there is a touch of Luther's rhetoric. This is how Luther talked all the time. This is the first time we find anything like that from Zwingli, and it was only in a private letter. But it shows that by 1519, his opposition to the papacy in its political role in Europe had now turned much deeper, and he was seeing the Church of Rome as a disgrace on the face of Christianity. 1519 is also a crucial year because in the fall of that year, a plague came to Zurich. Zwingli at the time was out vacationing on the lake, taking the waters or whatever. But as soon as he heard the plague had broken out in the city, very commendably, he rushed back to town to minister to the sick, exposed himself to the disease, and he caught it. And he spent weeks in a dreadful state of fever. Now, I don't know how it is with you, but when I'm down with the flu or the fever or something like that, I, I'm no good at my usual literary activity. I can't write speeches or papers or anything. 
Wingley, however, was made of stern stuff in this regard. While he had the fever, the pest, the plague, he managed to write three lengthy poems, the most important of which is the third, which has come down to us in history under the name of the Pest Lead, the Plague Song. And in it, uh, I'm going to quote you a passage that shows, on the one hand, a very commendable attitude, but from which, nevertheless, in later life, Wingley will draw a terrible lesson. Here's the passage. Help me, Lord God, help me in this necessity. I feel that death is at my door. Come, O Christ, to my aid, for you have conquered. I cry unto you, if it is your good pleasure, take away this fever which has wounded me and which doesn't leave me for a single hour. I can't get any sleep. If you will write off that I die here in the middle of my days, thy will be done. Do as you please. I'm your vessel. Keep it or break it. And then take to yourself my spirit far from the earth and bring it about that my spirit does not become wicked and that I never soil pure life and morals. Well, that's nice sentiment for somebody to say while sick, I leave it to your will, O God. Uh, if you want me to die, that's fine. If you, but then please take me to heaven. Uh, if you will that I live, it's up to you. I'm your vessel. Use me or smash me. Nothing wrong with that, except that in later life, he will draw from this plague experience the lesson that all his previous hopes for the nobility of man, human letters, classical literature, human virtue, and so on, all the hopes that he had gotten from Erasmus and the humanists were in vain. That man was in the end nothing. He took his quite literal weakness as a sign of his ontological nullity, which is nothing. He will get the idea that God is everything, man is nothing, because one of the characteristics of Zwingli's thought as we will see more after our break, is to throw up serious dichotomies. If the creature does something, God doesn't. If God does something, the creature doesn't. So the God and the creature are rivals for strength, success, effect, and so on. All right, now, in 1520, he gets over the plague, and in 1522, he entered into his revolutionary period. He began preaching more and more overt revolutionary things. By the end of 1522, he had rejected the authority of the Bishop of Constance. The bishop had heard about some of the things Wingley was preaching and called him to come and defend himself, uh, come and retract, he absolutely refused to go and wrote a very insulting letter back to the bishop. The revolutionary stage started with Zwingli preaching that the fasting rules of the church were merely human inventions, purely human inventions, traditions of men, something like the Pharisees had brought in, and therefore there was no sin at all in ignoring the fasting laws. Okay. Now this he preached, and in a pattern which became standard, he got it pushed through the city council that everybody could meet, eat meat on Ash Wednesday. That was what the crisis was about. The city council went along with abolishing the Ash Wednesday fast. Zwingli himself kept the fast. <laughs> in case he might need a defense later on. <laughs> but he preached that it not be kept and that all these disciplinary rules were mere conventions of men. His big dispute when he got himself 
uh, appointed more or less the new bishop of the city was in 1523. Let me read you a couple of passages here, and then we're going to have to take our break. Zwingli precipitated a dispute with the monks. This was in July. Okay? He wanted to convince them that the religious way of life was pointless. It's not in the gospel. He had his dispute with them over the issue, should one preach anything but the gospel? By the gospel, he meant the text. The text of the, of the synoptics, the text of John. Should you preach anything but the text? The monks said, John, yeah, sure. You should preach the fathers and the theologians and the epistles. And... No, you must preach only the gospel said Zwingli. And since he was uh, the main preacher in the city, he said, I am in this city of Zurich. The bishop and the cure and the care of souls has been conferred upon me. I preach the sermon on this subject and the monks have not obeyed. Okay? They owe me respect and not me them. Woo. So he invites the monks to a public disputation. Now, come on. Zwingli's got all this Latin. He's got all this Greek. He knows Erasmus. And these monks, you know, goodness knows what kind of education they had. So he's picking on easy targets. By the way, he always ducked competent debaters. But he would take on these monks. And then somebody had to judge the debate. Whom do you think he picked to judge the debate? And the city council became the ultimate judge of doctrine. He called all of the priests in the canton to come to a public dispute in January of 1523. Uh, he had a good setting again. Zwingli himself was the preacher of great renown. He commented on the Bible. And then he challenged any other priest to disagree with him. And he set up the city council again to regulate or judge the dispute based on the sole use of scripture. Have I won by sole use of the scripture, O members of the city council? All right, here you've got it. These burghers who had no ability to judge theological matters or scripture exegesis or anything like that became the final judges. By a majority of votes, they could determine what was to be theological truth in Zurich as if they were an ecumenical council. There is the revolution, a transfer of sovereign authority in the church, a displacement of values, a rejection of the magisterium of the church formed by the pope and the bishops, rejection of the entire Catholic past, appeal to the Bible alone, judgment taken away from the successors of the apostles vested in city council nothing much needs more to be told about his life, he gets, in, he gets in disputes with Luther, he gets involved in politics again and as I told you last week in 1531 he gets killed in that war intercanton war you know, thought he could wield the sword pretty well, it turned out the Catholics were better soldiers than he was. Well, we're swingly. Let's take our seven-minute break, and then we will get to your tail, won't you? Okay. All right. It's time to talk a little bit about Zwingli's theology. And I don't know how much we'll be able to get into because there are lots of topics that need to be hit upon. You need to know that Zwingli's work is divided for theological purpose into three periods. In the first period, 1523 to 24, he's mainly writing against the Catholic Church. These are his anti-Catholic polemics. Then, in 1525 to 1527, he switches ground. He has a different set of enemies. In those two years, his enemies are the Anabaptists and the Lutherans. Now, 1525 is a very interesting year. That was the year of the Great Peasant Revolt in Germany. And it was also the year of Anabaptist uprisings. 
Now, the Anabaptist thing was not all that big in Switzerland, but it did exist there and posed a profound embarrassment to Zwingli for reasons which uh, will become clear in a moment. If you don't have the magisterium of the church with the charism of the apostles to guide you in the interpretation of scripture, where do you get your certitude that you have understood the scripture properly? <laughs> <laughs> and how do you handle, if you are a reformer and therefore kind of like Augustine, at least his anti Pelagian works, how do you handle the famous quote from St. Augustine where he said, I wouldn't have believed the gospel if the church hadn't pointed me to it? Everybody has mentioned this again, and it especially comes up in discussions of where the canon came from. We all know that the canon was worked out by decisions of the hierarchy in the first three centuries. Part of the canon was settled from the Old Testament, but then what New Testament books to accept as original apostolic and so on was decided by church authority. If you throw that authority out, what's your authority for the canon? Now, Luther had a theory about this. Wacko, but it was a theory. <laughs> Luther's theory was that the words of the Bible, the inspired words, had physical power. They not only had a mystical meaning, but a physical power to persuade. The very preaching of the word, the hearing of the word, would put the word in a place to influence people, change people, get into their hearts, the word had a kind of physical power to do that. In other words, Luther attributed to the text of scripture a power similar to what we Catholics would attribute to the, the genuine sacraments. Through them, God works. They become instruments in his hands, and they cause what they signify, they produce, yes, effects in the order of grace. Luther thought that the text of the Bible did the same. No wonder he was so devoted to the text. Insisted on getting it into German, where, of course, it could have more persuasive power for people who didn't know any other language. Zwingli profoundly disagreed with his position of Luther's. Well, where did he think you got your certitude about correct interpretation or your persuasion of the truth of the text or any of that. Where do you think you got it? Luther's answer is not from the exterior word, the word which is preached, the word which is in Latin or German or Greek, but from an inner word. And this inner word is the very mind of the Holy Spirit at work within you. So, the deal is this. The Holy Spirit is at work within you and gives you faith. Through that faith, you become the sure interpreter of Scripture. So now get this. The way you and I look at things, the Scripture, rightly interpreted, is the judge of our faith. We learn from the scripture wherein to put our faith, what to expect from Christ, from the hope that God gives us and so on, and from the various gifts he's given to his church. We learn from the word how we should believe. Zwingli reverses that. We get from this interior touch of the spirit, which he identifies with faith in the soul, from there we get the right interpretation of scripture. So instead of our faith being under the judgment of God's word in scripture, God's word in scripture is under the judgment of um, God's word in our souls. Shall we put it that way? Uh-huh. That's a pretty short step from there to Quakerism. 
our very faith becomes the judge of what is and is not to be believed. He insists that the Holy Spirit has no need of any vehicle. He himself is the power that bears all things. So the Holy Spirit makes the word alive, makes the word understood, and gives us the key to its interpretation. Now then, if the Spirit can do all that, why do we have the external word at all written or preached? Zwingli's answer to that is another appeal to Scotist voluntarism. We have it just because God wanted it that way. He needn't have provided a verbal revelation at all. The Holy Spirit could tell us everything we need to know inwardly, I don't know, non-linguistically, preconceptually, mystically, I don't know what. We could learn everything we need to know directly from the Spirit. The Word isn't necessary. God just added it because that's the way he wanted things. Again, an appeal to an arbitrary divine volition. Then Zwingli ran into the fateful year of 1525 and the Anabaptist uprising. The Anabaptists had been thrilled with Zwingli's preaching because it made the heart the ultimate test of rectitude and revelation. The heart became the ultimate judge of the scripture. So now, was it less than clear from the scriptures whether we should baptize infants or not? We have a lot of cases of people baptizing adults in the New Testament. On the other hand, there's that time when uh, Paul baptizes the, the jailer and his whole household with their babies in that. You could argue from the parallel between baptism and circumcision that babies ought to be baptized, but is that really right? After all, they can't do the conscious act of faith. So, all of these indications going in different directions, which will involve the mainline reformers in thoroughgoing disputes. For the Anabaptists have a very simple answer. Look into your heart. Do you feel inwardly with the certitude of the Spirit that baptism is for adults alone? Then it is. And we stop all the infant baptism. Okay. And all of a sudden, all external preachers, Wingley himself, are not so necessary anymore. <laughs> a whole society can be set up and run on immediate divine inspiration. Well, the disorders of the Anabaptists terrified Zwingli, who then began to draw back and to modify his position. He did admit that there is no other magisterium than the collective religious consciousness of Christians. But it's a collective consciousness. It's a community thing. Yes, the instinct of the faith is the interpreter of scripture, but it's the community's faith and not the individual's faith. And so these extreme Anabaptist individualists are off the reservation. That's how he dealt with that issue. I would have to submit to you that it was not a very satisfactory Resolution? After all, where does the community get this <coughs> instinct or consensus of faith? Ah, last year I was in here talking about the ecumenical councils in antiquity. And I, I may have mentioned something about the, uh, the monophysite mess. The entire huge archdiocese patriarchate of Egypt was convinced that there was only one nature in the Incarnate Word. When the Ecumenical Council of Chalcedon decided otherwise, careful study, exact attention paid to the Fathers and the Scriptures, decided that there are two natures in our Lord, not confused, not fused, 
so that he exists in his person with a divine nature and a human nature at once. But the two natures are not fused, they're distinct. Two natures in one person, the entire huge patriarchate of Egypt went into schism. Does this mean that the, the community hadn't reached consensus? <laughs> Does this mean that we throw out Chalcedon? Zwingli never settled that question for himself. He never even raised it. He couldn't afford to raise it. And he sometimes, by the community, sometimes meant the worldwide community of believers. Sometimes, on the other hand, he just meant the local community. And I want to turn next to the problem of the sacraments. Zwingli, I stressed earlier, was a a humanist, that is to say, an admirer of ancient literature. And if you think of the poems and rhetorical works of antiquity, you will notice or you will recall how full of figures of speech they are. They're rife with metaphor. That habit of humanist thinking, Zwingli retained in his anti-humanist or revolutionary period, and was fully convinced that scripture was full of figures of speech and not to be taken literally if the literal interpretation would pose a mystery that was just a, a too much to be believed. So he early on decided that the words of institution in the gospel, this is my body, could not be literally true. He thought that the is there was metaphorical, or it should be translated with the word means. This means my body. So Christ is talking about the bread. He's not talking about his own body. He's talking about the bread. And he says, this means my body. The result is uh, a total rejection, not only of Catholic transubstantiation, but of any idea of a real presence of Christ in the Eucharist in his substance. Uh, Luther thought also that transubstantiation was unbelievable, but he thought that the body of Christ became, the real body of Christ became present underneath the substance of the bread. So for Luther, during the Eucharistic service, you have two substances present on the altar, the bread and the body of Christ. Neither changes into the other, but the body just gets there and sort of hides under the bread. Right. That was called consubstantiation. Zwingli rejected that too. Okay. For Zwingli, it's very simple. Christ is present in the Eucharist as the signified is present in the sign. The Eucharist is a sign. What it signifies, it brings to mind. But that's all. I'm going to put a phrase on the board. I hope you don't mind. Uh, there's a certain animal in the Washington Zoo that I'm very fond of. I hope you don't find it too horrible. My phrase is the rhinoceros in the Washington Zoo. Now, we all know that there is such a thing. I hope all of you have been to the zoo and seen the various beasts. There's a rhinoceros there, I'm sure. So it exists. What's the relation between the phrase I now have on the board and that rather smelly large animal in the Washington Zoo? The answer is the relation of sign to signify. In other words, the Eucharist doesn't make the Lord Jesus in his body and blood any more present in church than this phrase makes that rhinoceros present in this room. Does everybody see? <laughs> Pure relation designed to signify. Luther was furious. Okay? As a matter of fact, when Zwingli was killed in 1531, Luther showed his Reformation solidarity by saying, serves him right. This is the judgment of God upon his blasphemies against the last son. Luther did not agree. Luther insisted that there had to be a real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. He rejects the Catholic explanation. 
but there has to be a real presence there. He and Zwingli had a famous disputation at uh, Marburg, the first uh, Protestant university ever founded. And I mentioned it last time. And the dispute was mainly about the Eucharist. It got into some surprisingly interesting technicalities. And uh, the dispute uh, just did not end in any substantive agreement. But here was the gist of the problem. Luther believes in the real presence, right? But Luther denies that priests have a special power to consecrate. He rejected the sacrament of orders. He rejected consecration in the Catholic sense. So he rejected the sacramental act whereby we believe the priest speaks in persona Christi and brings about that wonderful transformation, that real presence. So, Luther, you want to save the real presence? Tell me how it got there. How did the body of Christ get there if priests don't put it there? Okay, says Luther. No problem. You all remember from Christology class about the communicatio idiomatum the sharing of attributes between God and man in Christ. God has the attribute of being everywhere. Omnipresence. According to Luther, that divine attribute gets transferred to the human nature in Christ, especially after the resurrection. So just as God is everywhere in his divinity, And Christ, as God, is everywhere in his divinity. So also, in his human nature, he's everywhere. Well, this certainly is not the sharing of properties. Communicatio idiomatum is the fathers of the church ever understood it. For us, the communicatio is within the person. Both divine and human predicates can be attributed to the same Christ. But the natures don't attribute or don't sort of leak out their properties into each other. I mean, the divine nature doesn't get fleshly, and the human nature doesn't get to be everywhere. Ah, well, Luther, never mind. This stuff is all a little bit vague in his mind. Then he says, I have proof from Scripture that the body of Christ is everywhere. Doesn't it say, well, actually, this is the creed, doesn't it say that he has risen from the dead and is seated at the right hand of the Father? Right? He's seated at the right hand of the Father. Now, says Luther, put on your thinking cap. Where is the right hand of the Father? Luther says, wherever the Father is at work. Well, he's at work in everything. He's keeping you in being. He's you know, managing the cosmos and so on. Right in, the Father is everywhere, so our Lord is seated everywhere, says Luther. Okay, now then, there's a little bit of a problem that Luther didn't know how to handle. I don't know if I should tell you this or not. I'll tell you. (laughs) If the body of Christ is really present everywhere... Why should I bother to go to church to get it? Why can't I get communion in my breakfast Wheaties? Luther had no answer uh, except his own kind of appeal to the arbitrary will of God. His answer was, you don't, you pig, you swine. (laughs) Just because God is everywhere doesn't mean he's willing to give himself to you everywhere. It's uh, not much of a solution. Anyway, because of this idea that Christ's very humanity is everywhere present, Luther's position was called ubiquitism. Like bureaucrats in Washington, they are ubiquitous. All right. This metaphysical quote unquote solution Zwingli could not accept. Zwingli said, look, it's in the very nature of a body that it's limited, that it's in space, that it has three dimensions. 
it's absolutely impossible for a body to be present everywhere. Therefore, you can't explain the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist that way. And in fact, since transubstantiation is unthinkable, you can't explain it at all, so out with the whole thing. This was the great dispute at Marburg. It was over the attributes of our Lord, the attributes of bodies, the impossibility of a body being ubiquitous, and so on. By the way, in his anti-Catholic writings, Zwingli always understood our doctrine of transubstantiation and the real presence to mean that when we took communion, we were munching on Christ's flesh the way a cannibal would eat another human being. Uh, this was called the Capharnaitic interpretation of the Eucharist after uh, the, the scene there in John 6 that was at Capharnaum where the disciples couldn't understand uh, how can this man give us his flesh to eat and so on because they were thinking that this was like um, he eating human flesh. That's what Zwingli accused us of believing. He couldn't accuse Luther of that, but he accused Luther of holding another impossible position. So we really didn't like mysteries very much, so it was about to go either way. And it never occurred to him that a body could be in a place in a spiritual manner. Okay. This is what the scholastics always said. The body of Christ is indeed present in the Eucharist, but not the way meat is occupying space. When you hold up a consecrated host, it's not that our Lord's head is up here and his feet down there. Okay. The whole Christ is present in the whole host and in every particle thereof because he's present there modo spirituale, in the manner of a spirit. Okay. Suffice it to say, Luther and Zwingli could not come to agreement uh, on this matter. I never said that our Lord's body couldn't be in more than one place at once. It can't be ubiquitous, that's nonsense. But he can be really present in, uh, on every altar in Christendom. Okay. Wherever there's a consecrated host, he's present. Okay. So he can be present in many places at once. That's because he doesn't, in his Eucharistic presence, he, his body does not relate to space the way ours do. Okay. You can say it's in the host, just as you can say the soul is in your body. But it's not as though your soul is part up here and part down there. The whole soul is present in every part of the body. Okay. Moreover, our Lord um, is in heaven according to his divine nature. He can take a title based on his humanity and use it to refer to his divinity. Okay. That's no problem. Just as I can say, Mary's baby created the universe. I need to move on now to a very crucial subject in Zwingli's thought. The older he got, the more his mind concentrated on the issue of God's all-knowing providence. Okay. His last big work and the most fully uh, matured, carefully written work of his career was a book, De Providencia, on providence. Okay. He had interesting things to say here. He, of course, believed that God's providence reached to everything that happened. God foreknew all things. But Zwingli was not much interested in divine foreknowledge. He didn't deny it, but it's not where his interest was. His interest was in the divine will, another little remnant from Scotism. And he thought of God as the supreme good. And now he throws up, this is in his book, One Province, he throws up with us a dilemma based on the occurrence of evil in the world. Why doesn't God's providence exclude evil from the world? Okay. Well, he says we have here a dilemma. Either God can't do everything, 
He can't keep evil out of the world. In that case, he's not omnipotent. Or else he doesn't will everything. And in that case, he's not the sovereign good. Either he can't do everything, or things happen that he doesn't will. In that case, he, he doesn't will everything. And so he's not really in charge. He doesn't really will everything that happens. Reasons swing. Okay. Now I'm going to attack that in just a minute, somewhat technically. But before I get there, I want you to realize that when we're talking about evils here, we're not talking about the appetite of wolves vis-a-vis -vis lambs exclusively. We're not talking about earthquakes. We're talking about human sins. Zwingli believes that in order to maintain his omnipotence, we must also maintain that God wills everything. Okay. So your sins are willed by God. That's why they happen. Okay. Indeed, uh, Zwingli is prepared to say that you sin inevitably and necessarily. You, you sin by coercion. Okay. Your nature compels it, your psychology compels it, whatever. In the wake of Luther, Zwingli became another denier of free choice. This is what led to his complete break with Erasmus. Erasmus held on to free will and also his Catholic identity. Lu uh, Zwingli rejected both as Luther did. So man does not have free will. The reason you do what you do is because God wills it. Well, wait a minute. If God wills it, and my sins are evil, how can God be all good? Problem, right? Zwingli's answer is, our sins manifest the righteousness of God. He permits our sins, in fact, he wills our sins in order to have something to punish, show us to show his justice. Uh -huh. And also, so that there would be something to cry for Christ to redeem. So our sins simply redound to the glory of Christ and manifest the justice of God. What's the matter, How do you like that? Alright, now watch. I'm going to end on this note. There's tons of other stuff to discuss. But look, there is an orthodox proposition which I'm now going to put on the board. It has to do with the efficacy of God's will. Okay? If God wills that E let E stand for any event you like. If God wills that E, then E happens. What God wills to occur happens. Now then, I'm going to put on the board the converse of this proposition. When you convert a proposition, you switch the content of the if clause with the content of the other clause. That's called converting or transposing a proposition. Then we have, if E happens, then God wills that E. Now I'm going to ask you, logically trained persons that you are, <laughs> let's call this Proposition number one up here, and the converse we call proposition number two. I ask you, does proposition number one imply proposition number two? No. 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 Absolutely not. No proposition implies its converse. Okay. Not unless the two clauses are equivalent in some way. But generally speaking, it's a complete fallacy to switch the antecedent and the consequent. If I am Chinese, I am a man. If I'm a man, I'm Chinese. I don't think so. You cannot pull off a move like that, and yet this is exactly what Zwingli has done. Zwingli has made God, I'm going to make up a word here, omnivolent 
not omnipotent, but omnivolent, meaning willing everything. This claim is completely contrary to the tradition of the church. We have always maintained that nobody sins because God wills them to. Okay. If God, if you sin because God wills it, or if you sin, it follows that God wills it, then God wills sins. Okay. He does not will sins. Okay. Does he permit sins? Yes. Does he will them? No. With his will of good pleasure, he absolutely does not. I can't get over how stupid Proposition 2 is. <laughs> Let that be the end of our current discussion. Yes, sir. Um, now, Zwingli was the Bishop of Zurich. Um, well, he called himself that. Oh, well, he wasn't uh, the real no, no, okay. he, was, he was just the parish priest. Oh, okay. When did he actually become a heretic, and when was he condemned by the church? Okay, a number of his propositions were finally condemned at the Council of Trent, and even in the early sessions of Trent, so late 1540s. Okay. Um, he was um, um, considered excommunicate by the Bishop of Constance after his uh, after Zwingli's refusal to submit to him in um, 1522. So, I mean, his breach with the church is, is definitive in 1522. Yes, sir? Considering how infamous was the letter of Zwingli to the uh, church there in Zurich, why is it that the Protestant community did not destroy it? How did it see the light of death? It seems to me they want to suppress it. Suppress which? The, 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 the infamous letter of Zwingli to the church there in Zurich. Oh, it's very interesting. Uh, it wasn't a letter to the whole church. It was a letter to, to um, a canon named Udiger. Mm -hmm. And um, Zwingli's correspondence remained private for a very long time. As a matter of fact, there was no um, scholarly edition of his correspondence until the 20th century. Wow. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Um, to what extent does Swingley's concept of God's will track with Calvinistic concepts of predestination? And if you want to save that for next week, how does it track with um, the concept of God's will in Islam? Tracks with it as precursor thereof. Okay. Swingley is the man in the middle between Luther and Calvin. Okay. He will take Zwingli's ideas and push them even further and try to make it into an even more coherent system. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, Erasmus. Was he the Erasmus of the friend who was of uh, Thomas More? Yes. Yes, absolutely. He and More were great. And uh, Erasmus, by the way, had a wonderful opinion of More's talent and a very low opinion of Zwingli's talent. <laughs> you know, these, these humanist writers were very good at making digs at each other in letters to somebody else. And, <laughs> right. Erasmus often had occasion to write, have you seen Zwingli's book? It's pretty good. He didn't manage to say anything that I hadn't written before. <laughs> <laughs> Do you uh, find sort of threads of uh, Zwingli's uh, thought in uh, some of the uh, dissenting Catholic writers we have nowadays? <laughs> Funny you should ask. <laughs> you find it in several regards. All right. The downplaying of the sacrificial character of the Mass, uh, downplaying the emphasis on the real presence. For, for Zwingli, after all, the Mass was a community celebration. Something we do. Right? He didn't call it the Mass anywhere. He got rid of the Mass. He replaced it with a, with a, a you know, communion service. And it was a community celebration. And the only effect that the, you know, that the Eucharist had as a sign was to bring us together as a community. <laughs> <laughs> and 
you hear the same sort of stuff in dissenting theologies of baptism. Baptism doesn't really take away any sin from the souls of babies. They're precious little innocent things. They don't have any original sin. Zwingli was against the usual doctrine of original sin, by the way. So what is baptism for? It's to welcome the babies into the community. Okay. Now, you can dress that up with all kinds of covenant language, but that's basically what it amounts to. In a deeper vein, let me give you a quotation here from um, his book on Providence. People can speak of God. The terms that they use, being, life, fatherhood, light, omniscience, uh, omnipresence, are just the echo of their inner religious experiences. Mm -hmm. The scripture itself is no exception. It hands on the religious experience of the authors. Now there is A, textbook modernism, and B, uh, a position which has been arrived, uh, uh, revived in some dissenting quarters. After all, in order to make modernism work, or neo-modernism, you have to create a gap between anything you can encounter as a message okay, and the true speech of God. Let the true speech of God be something intangible in the heart. It influences you from within. It becomes a religious experience. Then what do you do? You try in your little human, historically limited and conditioned way to express that experience. And the result is the words of scripture. So instead of being God's word to us, scripture becomes man's word back to God trying to interpret what God has done within, in the warming of the heart. All right? Sufficient. <laughs> we hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist, pray for us.